Ashen is lovely, and I'd like to get that out there before we dive into the negatives, because there are many. It's a very Souls-like game, it's difficult to talk about in a vacuum, and even though the bar is high with Souls, for a first game, A44 knocked it out of the park. Ashen is a challenging $40 action-adventure RPG set in a moody, expansive, and beautiful world that is open to explore. At its best, you have satisfying combat, breathtaking landscapes, and some awe-inspiring moments, like this one where a new character you meet comes up and just envelops your screen, a massive step up in size from anything you'd seen before her. On the other hand, weapons are way too similar, discovery was rarely well rewarded, and I can't say there were enough of these moments, which in my eyes were some of the most memorable in the game. I would like to and will look at Ashen as its own game as much as I can, but whenever there is a Soulsborne comparison that can be used to contextualize a mechanic or design choice, I will consider it. This is a knife that cuts both ways though. There are many things that Ashen has done well, that have made me rethink what was actually good for my Souls experience in retrospect. You begin the game with a cutscene as the main character explains the situation you and the world are in. You are a faceless human who doesn't speak in a world dependent on light, fighting against those who prefer darkness. As you play through, more plot points develop and well, you get the picture. Once you finally emerge from this worryingly dark tutorial area, you and your new friend Jaquel are tossed into a cavern that eventually leads you to the Vagrant's Rest, your maid camp for the rest of the playthrough. From here, you have the ability to talk to NPCs and take on new quest lines. One thing I'd like to point out here before we talk about the rest of the game was the music, especially here. Everyone remembers what it was like to get back to Majula after a difficult and frustrating journey in Dark Souls 2. Well, rest assured, the OST for this game delivers on feelings like that, and then some. Now for me, the music, the plot, the lore, the characters, all come second to the gameplay, level design, and boss fights. So this is what we'll focus on from now on. The game has seven areas to explore and two dungeons that are equivalent in content to maybe an area apiece. Ashen gives you a fantastic jump mapped to a single button press, which is something Miyazaki never dared to offer us. This jump combined with a generous ledge grab allows you to get to parts of the map that seem unreachable which is refreshing, but here's the dark cloud looming in the background. Although each area has a lot to look at, your discovery as a player was rarely well rewarded. As you make your way through each area, you'll notice that climbing and jumping was always encouraged, but oftentimes you'll get somewhere you didn't think was possible, only to find a bag of scoria, or a craven remnant. When I compare this to the effort put into the rest of the game, discovery comes up seriously short. Here's for example a mini dungeon that you have to remember and come back to after you get the Shadow Travel ability. The area is quite difficult, hidden, and takes about 30 minutes to fully flesh out, but at the end of it you only find a bag of Scoria. A unique weapon, an ability, a feather, questline, or even mini boss might have made it feel worth it, but instead you get something you can farm anywhere else on the map in a matter of minutes. I feel like there should be something unique left to find in moments like these. It's funny because you could have taken any one of the 44 unique weapons in the game and put one here at the end of a tough cave and given the player the feeling that they discovered something others might have missed. And because everything gives you Scoria, what's there to entice a player to come back here on, say, a second playthrough? It's a shame that such an easy fix wasn't applied to so many situations in the game, and maybe that's because A44 chose to make sure the casual player doesn't miss out. But in my opinion, that's having one foot in the door and one foot out. Here's a game with lots of replayability, a big, expansive, open world map. It's hard like Souls likes are known to be, and yet it feels like there are tempered expectations of the very people Ashen is trying to attract. The weapons as is lack uniqueness, and we'll also get into that, but there are more than enough of them just laying around to throw a couple cool ones just a bit more out of reach. Now when it came to aesthetics, Ashen had their clothes picked out for the week. In particular, I thought the use of colors to distinguish moody from peaceful and decrepit from lavish areas all landed perfectly. And because you spend so much time in each area, it made it that much more enjoyable to explore at a leisurely pace and really just soak up the different palettes. Something else that was just mouth-wateringly well done was the transitions, as you left one area and entered another. For example, as you poke around in an innocent enough opening in the eye of the needle and are suddenly engulfed in the destitute atmosphere of Cinder's view. 
The relaxing notes of the piano and smooth violin wash away as the increasing winds bring the ambient music to a halt. The world you are in, merely feet away from the last, is directly contrasted in almost every sense and yet feels completely natural as a transition. As you find yourself getting to near completion of the world map, there's another shining moment just like that one. You traverse your way through a long winding canyon that seems to be all but abandoned with just the rickety remains of a shanty town and a few enemy inhabitants. Once you're done, you step out onto a mezzanine level view of the cracked path, a name that just doesn't do it justice. The seemingly forgotten village looks like it was hit by an earthquake and never revisited. From the time-worn clay buildings to the saturated crimson trees and the monstrous carcass-shaped mountains in the background, it's a view you absolutely will not forget finding. Once again, this is all brought home by the coalescing of breathtaking art and mood-directing sound design that gave me the same feeling as when I saw Irithyll for the first time in Dark Souls 3. One of the few moments that has made me feel truly nerdy for being astonished about art in a video game. The lighting in Ashen is also positively unforgettable. Right away, you are given a lantern that some might call necessary, but if you have gone through an area more than once, a dungeon for example, using your lantern you'll quickly realize is completely optional. This game gets pitch black at times, and while it can be hard to orient yourself, there's not a single situation where an enemy can't be discerned from the backdrop. There is always a silhouette, waning light, or protruding shadow that help you make out what is a wall and what isn't. It is so nice that if you are at all familiar with an area or just aren't curious what it looks like, you can keep your big weapon out and run through without harming the integrity of the atmosphere. Especially in the bone-chilling descent that was the first dungeon. Running through it five times can become tiresome, but with the lights off, you get two takes on the same area, and it's all your choice. The lighting alone is one reason I can't help but recommend people try this game for themselves. Ashen uses a passive multiplayer system to connect players that are in the same section of the game, and the way it works is kind of clever. If you're playing the game and you turn multiplayer on, your companion is someone else in the real world, and on their screen, you are the companion. If nobody else is available online in your area, an AI will help you fight, and for the most part, is helpful when clearing mobs. Whenever possible, I chose not to use a companion, but at certain parts of the game, there are ledges you need help getting on, or walls that won't open without a companion or a rune. Doing dungeons was also something I wanted to do alone, and so enabling and disabling a companion made it a bit more of a hassle. I could have compromised on a rune slot, but that felt kind of wasteful. Now it was clearly A44's intention and right to design the game around the companion system, and I would say it was well executed and cleverly done. I just personally didn't like being forced to use it as someone who turns off multiplayer and single player games, and so it just wasn't for me. Your Crimson Gourd is Estus, a great system that's tried and true. There are healing items, consumable buffs, and homeward bones to help you out in certain situations, and they all work as intended. Now what about upgrades? Well in Ashton you have runes and relics. Upgrading is something you can buy for your gourd and weapon, but not for you. For more HP and stamina, you complete quests, which is straightforward and generally incentivizes exploring areas. This is a nice system, as I've always had FOMO about placing stats in the wrong category and messing up a blind run where I wouldn't know what stats I definitely wanted. If you do want to hold out on upgrading your weapons but are scared of losing Scoria, you can purchase Scoria pouches for a small fee. This is kind of a rudimentary banking system that works just fine for me. All in all, it never felt too difficult to acquire enough Scoria, and I never felt behind on weapon or cord upgrades. The runes and relics in this game are also unlocked by completing random quests. In general, I found runes to be relatively unexciting, either providing slight bonuses, or merely making up for the stamina penalties that you get for wearing armor. The relics were made to be a more expensive option for giving you a passive buff or bonus, although I felt they were grossly overpriced in relation to other items in the game and after finishing a playthrough, would have prioritized upgrading my weapon or gourd over any single one that I found. Also, you're paying a loadout cost, meaning if you want to try on a new relic and change back, that'll be 20,000 Scoria, the equivalent of 3-4 to four gourd or weapon upgrades in the early to mid game. Remember that dungeon that only gave you 10,000 Scoria at the end of it? Now back to those armor penalties. 
First of all, just like with weapons, there are very few different pieces of armor to find. And in general, as a fashion over function player, I was quite disappointed to maybe find one outfit I would rate as cool. But that is subjective to me and maybe I'm alone on that. Either way, that one outfit I found as cool had a scathing stamina penalty. And any souls vet can attest, because you have invincibility frames while rolling, stamina is the most important stat in the game. You use it while running, attacking, rolling, blocking, basically anything that gets you anywhere in a fight. And if you run out, you're basically dog meat, or at least you should be in any challenging game. Ashen looked at stamina penalties as if this wasn't the case and basically said, you can cripple your ability to stay mobile for a small amount of damage reduction. Later on in the playthrough, you will find runes that can negate these penalties. But again, in that early to mid section, you are best off playing in your starting gear. Bloodborne has easily my favorite armor system, which is simply use whatever you think looks cool. No other armor will make much of a difference, and there are absolutely no penalties, only better or worse bonuses. This is one of the least fun parts about Ashen in my opinion, and one that I think could have been reworked without changing any of the gameplay decisions. As a combat oriented game, the experience versus a new enemy with a decent weapon feels fair, fun, and challenging all at the same time. There are spears that are fast and maybe track a bit too well, and some attacks like this one that get a bit wonky, but because you have iframes, dodging on timing was always viable, and there didn't seem to be any attacks that couldn't be telegraphed in some way. That being said, I wouldn't be surprised if others saw this as unreasonable, as the tracking at times broke any of the physical limits the game wanted to pretend that it had. Something I like about the mobs is that there are a lot of human-sized enemies, which in my experience are usually the most challenging, but also least annoying. Short, small, or jumpy enemies are squishy, but usually also a pain to kill, and outside of the dungeons, I think we're peppered in fairly. The game has simplistic combat. One-handed weapons swing quickly and like this. Two-handed weapons swing slowly and like this. There are shields, which you probably won't use in place of a lantern, and there is no parrying, reposting, or backstabbing available with any weapon combination. You do have a charged R2, but it pretty much just does some damage. And the simplistic combat design is totally fine for me, as I'm the kind of player to grab the biggest sword available and max strength, but to others that might not be as intriguing, so be forewarned. There are limited enemy types in Ashen, but because most enemies are decently fun to fight, I never found clearing mobs to be monotonous, unless I was repeatedly getting my ass kicked in a dungeon. For better or worse, the dungeons in Ashen stand out. The most surprisingly nice effect they had on my playthrough was learning that the world map wasn't an accurate indication for how much or how little content I had left, and I appreciated that. The dark side of the dungeon is, well, a two-parter for me. On the one hand, the dungeons are long and difficult, which is nice, but on the other, some of the enemy types caused frustrating deaths that felt out of your control. And that feeling of frustration was amplified by the thought that you're supposed to be using a companion to help you through. It was as if I had asked to fight a losing battle since I was going against the game's wishes of using a companion, which would have been okay if companions were a bit more predictable. I think for something as hard as dungeons, it's gratifying to work your way through, mapping out each encounter, and eventually mastering each section. But with a companion, the variability made that less consistent and less fun. The first time you walk into a dungeon, you get about 10% of the way down and are presented with a free gourd refill and a giant wall that opens up if you've got someone to help you. This is A44 suggesting that the dungeons were optimized for a player and a friend to work together to beat. Now sometimes your sidekick did put up numbers, but that never made up for the feeling of taking a stray hit from an enemy that you didn't aggro yourself, or a mob that you were trying to take on carefully, now all coming at you at once, just because your buddy overextended. Dungeons felt great to master. It just didn't feel great to doubt yourself in tough moments and wonder if the rest of the game will be fun without a companion or if it'll feel annoying and unfair like dungeons sometimes did. I never actually found a way to get past the bottom of the first dungeon alone because of the specific pack of Elder Darks that refused to let you heal, but thankfully I did find a well-hidden shortcut that circumvented all of this and that was in my eyes a saving grace of this dungeon. It was also tastefully foreshadowed at the companion wall, which I think is meant to create a kind of aha moment for you in your next playthrough. The second dungeon in the game is also completely absurd, especially to do alone. 
Even with a companion, they typically won't last that long, but if you are careful and observant, you can bait these seemingly innumerable wraiths and slowly work your way through this palace that also takes on a sense of overt difficulty and relentlessness with how long it was. All in all, while more difficult to learn, I thought that the mastery of it was quite rewarding, and because you never got overwhelmed if you were careful, it felt like more of what the first dungeon ought to have been. And it was topped off with the first of two difficult boss fights in the game. Ashen is a game that is somewhat plot driven, but generally speaking is about exploring, killing mobs, and brute forcing your way through areas with your improving combat abilities and upgrades. One thing I feel like many will have a sour taste in their mouth about after completing the game is that there seems to be very little thought given to the contrasting levels of difficulty from area to dungeon to boss. In general, areas in the game are what you naturally base the difficulty of the game off of. But as I mentioned earlier with the dungeons, the game goes from hard to gnarly, but then the first boss after the initial dungeon is a joke. Okay, he looks great and the concept and mood and atmosphere was awesome, but where is the challenge? It is A44's choice if they want to have hard things or not, but how can a boss not be the culmination of a preceding area in terms of difficulty? This is one thing that doesn't make sense to me. I defeated Geffen in one try with no companion and I exited relieved but confused why the dungeon left more of an impression on me than the boss did. Out of the five bosses in the game, only the last two took more than one try, and the only reason the last boss took more than 30 minutes was because the run back was also absolutely unbelievable. But more specifically, unbelievable relative to the rest of the game, which is the overarching issue for me. Getting to Gwyn in Dark Souls 1, for example, takes so much time, but plenty of bosses in Dark Souls 1 had painfully long and treacherous run backs. You were used to it. By the time you got to Gwyn, it was like, oh, Miyazaki, as opposed to, where the fuck did they hide the bonfire, which is the feeling I got when I spawned in the Vagrant's Rest after dying to Cisna. It's also pretty weird that you spawned again in the Vagrant's Rest with the guy who just died and the chick who killed him standing right next to each other. Now, I wouldn't want that to put a damp in on the fights themselves. While easy, I found the themes, concepts, and aesthetics interesting for the first three bosses, and the overall experience of Shadow and Cisna to be simplistic but still hard, which aligns better with the preceding areas that you had to fight through to get to them. All that being said, I do wish Ashen had more boss fights. I think there was room for bosses of in-between difficulty after Amirin and before Shadow of Ashen. I think there were plenty of opportunities for them to make cameos to complement those wonderful transitional moments in between areas, and I'm not sure why there were only five in the game. It does take the game down a notch for me, but for what it's worth, I'm happy we didn't get any poorly thought out or gimmicky fights. I've completed two playthroughs of Ashen, and part of that was so that I could write up this review. Normally, I don't get excited about playing games through twice, but I did have a good time with Ashen on both occasions, and I found a solid amount of content that I completely missed on my first playthrough. As a Souls-like, I appreciate A44 breaking ground with a more open-world experience and a set of wonderful tools for exploring. I do wish the game had more secrets and rewarded curious players better, but I think there is a fair amount of content offered for the price, albeit potentially a little high. The art and sound direction are what I think most people will leave the game feeling pleased about, but there's nothing that'll really make you sour. I think it's pretty much fun all the way through. No real blight towns, if you will. I certainly can say I regret playing the game, and I would highly recommend it to anybody who can't get enough souls if they've got a bit of extra money to spend. For me, if I had to put a number on it, it'd probably be an 8 out of 10. Leave a like, comment if you want more single-player game reviews, and hit the store for some merch. Goodbye.